Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Special Codes. I'm Taylor. And I'm Nathan. And last episode, we talked a little bit about binary and what computers do. And now, this episode, I would like to get into what actually happens inside the physical machine when it sees binary. As in, when the computer sees a 1, what does it do? And a 0, what does it do? Binary is a two number system, you have a one and a zero. And effectively one is on and zero is off. And we talked a little bit about why computers use binary because it's very stable. The reason being a system that uses more than two numbers would become unstable as the computer system ages and degrades and the signals will become more and more confused. And we also touched on how we can apply the principles of binary to our lives and when they are and when they aren't appropriate. This episode, we're going to go deeper into binary, but more into the actual physical, mechanical workings of binary inside of a computer, as in what actually really happens when you send it a zero or a one. So the basic idea is that, as we discussed earlier, a 1 is on and a 0 is off. What that translates to is a voltage or no voltage being sent into the computer. So if there's a 1, it sends a little pulse of electricity. If there's a 0, it doesn't. To give a physical example of this, it would be like if I put my finger in a plug and you turn the light switch on, I would go, ah! Maybe. I don't know if I would actually make a sound. But then when it went off, then no sound would happen, right? You're right. <laughs> it's like flipping the light switch on and off multiple times just to hear you scream on and off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So we know that it's we know that there is a on when Nathan makes a noise, and we know there's an off <laughs> when he's quiet for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> And as you can imagine, since it is sending voltages, <laughs> it does tend to wear systems out because there is a voltage traveling over there and it can heat components up. That's why computers have cooling systems. That's why gamers with high-end computers will get liquid cooling because they're, they're sending a whole lot of ones and zeros through their system. <laughs> So they're sending Very a whole quickly. lot of they're sending a lot a lot of uh, electricity that causes a lot of screaming inside. <laughs> mm -hmm. So without cooling, your computer will scream itself into being burnt out, mm. and eventually and Nathan would die. Well, and it happens so fast that we probably can't actually physically comprehend the how fast it's happening, right? Because it's right. happening so fast. So if it were, if we were to use my screaming analogy, it almost would sound like I'm screaming constantly because <laughs> we can't, it's happening so fast. Well, well, to give an example of something that already does that that's really fast that we don't see, any computer monitor. Oh, you're yeah. Not, you're not actually staring at a moving image or at a, even a constant image. Mm -hmm. What you're staring at is a really, really fast slideshow. Yeah. That's why when you take a video camera and you try to record a TV screen, there's that bar that appears. Because mm -hmm. you're can't, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it, it, what it does is it'll, it'll create an image on the screen, then refresh it with another one rapidly. Mm -hmm. And we as humans, our eyes, unless it's, it has really low frames per second, but typically around 30 frames per second, visually, it's hard for us to distinguish that there are separate frames in there. Mm. Now, before I set off a lot of people in the comments about that, there is a huge difference in frames per second in terms of control versus just visual in that it, when you're actually controlling like a video game or something, the higher the FPS, the smoother the inputs and controls are. And FPS stands for frames per yes, second. Yes, frames per second. Right. Especially in games where you need fast reactions, the higher the frames per second, 
the smoother and better it will control. Even though you might not be able to visually tell a difference Mm -hmm. just from observing from the outside, playing something in 60 versus 30 FPS is noticeable. Yeah. And it's just more or less noticeable depending on what game you're playing, too. Well, and two, it sounds like based on how technology moves, I can remember growing up and playing on the 360. And because it was having, I mean, honestly, right now it has a probably lower FPS than the new systems that are coming out. But two, you're talking about the wear and tear on technology. And I remember this great and awesome thing that caused many, many children to cry called the Ring of Death. Right, red, red ring of death. <laughs> right, and and it happens because of exactly what you're talking about. It, what we talked about is like power goes through it so rapidly that it does cause internal things to happen. Now, some people rage quit and cause other things to happen, and <laughs> you know, so the red ring of death doesn't always happen from this. But because of what you're talking is about, is that that power will wear even with just the on and off switches on technology. Right? Am I right in that? Yeah. Yeah, technology, everything wears out over time. If you're pulling power into it, whenever you send a voltage in, it's going to generate heat, and that's going to, over time, cause various issues. There are ways to mitigate that, and that's why a lot of gamers who play a lot of video games or a lot, even the people who do animations and artistic stuff like that will get very high powered computers with expensive cooling methods of cooling just to carry that heat away and reduce the damage and if you overheat a computer in some senses that can cause irreparable damage like so i had a i had a laptop this actually happened to both laptops i've owned in the past <laughs> <laughs> two two laptops, two of my first ones. The laptop I had in high school started overheating. And at first, you know, it was just once a day it would overheat. Then it continued to overheat more and more. And when it overheats, it would just turn off. So I got a new laptop and the same thing had happened. And that's that's the kind of thing that just happens over time with age after a few years of using it. Things well, are just going to wear out. Well, and, and like, this is why people will, I mean, people who don't know much about laptops or technology, this is kind of a bonus thing is I learned at an early, early stage of my life that when you have your laptop on your lap while you're watching TV and a blanket is underneath it, you're preventing air to cool off the system from yes. going into it. And so it'll even overheat doing that. So having some space to where air can circulate really helps because when that heating does happen, you're right, damage can happen. So finding ways to help mitigate, even like right now, my laptop's sitting on top of a, a fan so it can stay cool. Yes. There are cooling pads that you can get with fans inbuilt that you can plug into your laptop. I've started using one every time I use my laptops. Coolant is incredibly important, but bringing it back to computer logic, let's talk about the processes a computer goes through. And particularly, there are things called logic gates in computers, which if you look at circuit boards, there are parts that do this. I'm not going to get into all of the parts and what they get into, what they do. I'm just going to talk about the basic gate and what happens when the signal is sent to it. So the idea of a logic gate is basically when you send a binary signal, it receives a one or a zero, and it might receive another one or a zero coming in from a different area because there's a circuit board depending on what has happened before, it can send the signal to different areas. So it'll receive a signal in this gate, and depending on what that signal is, it will either send another signal out or not send any signal. Mm. That's the basic idea of a logic gate. It's basically what allows a computer to do math and pretty much anything. What I really want to focus on are probably the most basic gates the AND gates, the OR gates, and the NOT gates. 
Okay. So there's technically four gates, but they're pretty, pretty basic. The not gates, I think, are the most confusing once you figure them out and you really think about them and you know what they are, they become intuitive. Okay. Well, let's start with the AND gate. Woot woot! AND gate! So an AND gate is, is pretty simple. It is basically a circuit or a gate in your system that takes two inputs and it'll only output one signal from those two signals. Mm. So... Basically, what an AND gate does is says, if I get a 1 on this signal input and another 1 on this signal input, I will send a 1 out, i.e. I will send a voltage out because I got two voltages on mm. my input, mm -hmm. input areas, so I will now send an input out. However... If I say I'm going to send one, send a one to one input, but a zero to the other input, then I'm not going to send out a voltage because an AND gate needs both inputs to have a voltage or be a one in order to send a signal out. Yeah, so it needs both things to create uh, something to send out that has power. So to, to think of it this way, if I get a 1 and a 1, I'm going to send out a 1. If I get a 0 and a 1, I'm going to send out a 0. If I get a 0 and a 0, I'm sending out a 0. So when, when you say sending out, maybe this is a little confusing to me too, because isn't the sig is the signal constantly going out in the sense that I will... Once that AND gate stops receiving both ones, does it just constantly have nothing going out? Is that right? Or Well, basically, yes, for the most basic versions. A zero is just no voltage, right? Right, so, so they're just saying, like, no power. Okay. Because when you said send out, because that was where I got a little confused, is saying you said yeah. no power is going out. In order for this to really make sense... Another thing to understand is that computers basically function in blocks of binary. Mm. Like, if I just send it a random string of things, it's, it's not necessarily going to know what to do. And the question is, well, if it's a zero, one, and a zero is a no signal, it does something, then why isn't it always just doing something if there's nothing happening, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's because computers function on... Think of them as blocks. There are certain numbers of zeros and ones they are looking at at any given time or expecting. So they come so, in kind of like bl sequenced blocks? Is that kind of how yes, they look? kind of. Okay. So think of it this way. Just for our example, I'm not saying this is what every computer does or how they work. We're just looking at a, a string of four numbers at a time. Mm -hmm. And depending on if I get... If the signal I'm expecting for that first one is a zero, and the second one is a one, and, and the third one is a one, and the fourth one is zero, I know what to do versus any other mixture of those, right? Mm -hmm. So okay. if there is no block, effectively, that I'm looking for, expecting, then nothing happens, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so that's a basic way of understanding what's going on, why nothing is just going to happen at random. Okay. Okay. Because it because they come in blocks. Okay. So what's the next gate? So the the next gate is the or gate, which is different from the and gate because the or gate only needs one or both of its inputs to be a one. So it's kind of so, like the exact opposite of the and gate. Well, I wouldn't say the opposite. Mm, okay. That would be a not and would be the opposite, but we can get into that. Okay. But an or, or gate, for example, if I send the first input as a one, the second one is a zero, it's going to send out a one because it, there was a one there. If I send two zeros to it, it's not going to send anything because there's no one. If I send two ones, it's going to send out a one because it just needs one. So it's not the opposite because if it was the opposite then there would be a zero where the 
where the one and one are coming in and we don't see that happening with the or gate right right okay so we could say it's 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 reciprocal that's my math teacher coming out <laughs> it's it's flipped reciprocal so in the first one we have three off and one on in this one we have one on and three i mean one off and three on right so it's it's reciprocal there's a math right. term for you <laughs> <laughs> very good thank you <laughs> so those those are the two simplest gates yeah and i think it's important too to note that they both have two inputs but they have one output right yes okay yeah. cool and then we get into the not gates which if you don't know what the original gates are and we go into the not gates they they can get a little confusing because the not gates are just the exact opposites mm. of each one and this so, is where it's just okay right so the not or only sends a signal when either when neither input has a voltage interesting so it's like it, it is literally the opposite because with a and gate the only time it sends a signal is when there's an on on the not and gate sends a signal with everything except for when both are on the not and can send a one when there's a zero on both inputs and it also can send a one when there's only one input right okay so cool. if i send a one or and a zero it's gonna send a one but if i send it a one and a one it's gonna send a zero mm -hmm. right so which the, makes so just it for clarification the not and is different from the not or because a not and send a, sends a signal if both inputs R zero or at least one input is zero. Yeah. And, then and if, not or only sends an input when both are zero. Yeah, and if this is a little con I'm a visual person. So if you say like in and out and all of this stuff, my mind's like, you know, I might actually I've got kind of a creative mind. So you put in and out. I I would probably think of like a needle threading through and going really crazy not linear thinking necessarily so this is a very linear process where there are lines that lead to something and go straight out right right and if you're mathematical about it just take the output from the normal gate whatever it would be and flip it mm -hmm. if you want the not gate answer right so it just kind of turns it opposite of it it's of itself yeah right yeah, so, I mean, math speaking, if it was positive, it would have been negative. If it was negative, it would have been positive, you know. Right. Except in this case, the negative is zero and the positive is a one. Right. Which means on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. So, cool. Yeah, and don't worry if this is confusing. As you can tell, even I get confused. <laughs> yeah. Time to time. Well, and even when we started talking about logic gates, I sat here and I was listening it, to the explanation because obviously we've been working on this for a couple months now and I was really confused I had to ask a lot of questions and so in the comments if there's something that we didn't necessarily make clarification ask it and we don't mind responding but it also refers back to the purpose for our show we're not a tutorial on gates right Taylor and I are not here to necessarily teach you about logic gates we're here to make connections kind of like a logic gate does and we're 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 really bringing the focus going back to like our our mission statement on this is is we're using code or things within coding to interpret the world around us in a meaningful way that builds up and makes us more human and we really felt like as we were talking about this that the understanding that happens with a gate really means something to make us more human right yeah we're, we're not going to teach you all the ins and outs of gates we just want you to know the basic concept of what these gates are and what their function is so that we can get into discussing how they relate to us as humans so we've been talking about gates and the logic gate specifically with binary 
And one of the things that we want to do right now is we want to switch the gears from the computer side and really bring in the idea of how how does this apply to us and help us become more human, interacting with one another. One of the things that really stuck out to us as we were discussing gates in particular, and specifically our AND gate, our OR gate, and our NOT gate, is this amazing power that we can see happening behind the scenes, and specifically for our lives, how we as humans are able to check what is and is not acceptable or how should we interact with things, our responses to certain things. And what Taylor and I have kind of figured out, it's, it's been actually a fun journey with our AND gates and our OR gates. I've actually used this a lot in my life now, just kind of asking myself, is this an AND gate? Is this an OR gate? Is this a, a NOT gate? Because when we look at these specifically, let's start with the AND gate. <clears throat> The AND gate acts as this kind of dual input, right? So we have the input coming on both sides. So there's two elements to this. And then it comes out with one on or off or, or respond or non-respond, right, Taylor? Right. Do I have that? I have that correct, right? In, you have in what's... that correct. Okay, good. So one of the things that we were talking about is that AND gates, as it relates to us as humans, are really kind of our safety net. They're the things that we put in our lives that cause us to act in safe ways. So for example, and, and Taylor, you can give some examples here in a little bit too, maybe to help clarify this. But when we talk about like AND gates, one of the examples that <laughs> was given to me <laughs> by my stepdad, actually, as I was talking to him about this, he said, you're in an airplane. That's your input one. You have a life jacket. I mean, not a life jacket, but a parachute. So you can jump, right? So because both of those inputs have met the requirements for jumping out of a plane, you can go. But if one of those inputs isn't going, like I'm not in an airplane, but I have a life jacket, should I? I mean, why do I keep calling a life jacket? Because <laughs> it can save your life. You yeah, know? it's a life jacket. No, a parachute. If I have a parachute, but I'm not in a plane, should I really be jumping? Or the other end is I'm in an airplane, but I don't have a parachute. Should I jump? That's a safety thing that prevents us from making kind of dumb decisions, right? Do you have any other examples, Taylor, maybe to kind of clarify? Well, this can be even in determining what you do or do not believe if somebody's telling you the truth or not. Interesting. Because if somebody comes to you, if you're trying to figure out well, let's, let's just do like a murder mystery. Mm -hmm. You want to find out who killed somebody, you have to have this piece of evidence and this piece of evidence in order to determine who the killer is. Mm -hmm. You have to have the fingerprints and the weapon. If you don't have either or, it might be very difficult to convict somebody and could get it wrong. Mm -hmm. It helps you in defending you in some regards against false information like if somebody tells you something that's not true and you have an input that's missing then that signal won't go out and you won't act on that hmm. so i have a question for you taylor and i was just thinking about this if we have an and gate can there be more than two inputs we can get into more complicated circuits if we want, but for the purposes of this, the AND gates that we're dealing with only have two inputs. Okay. However, in terms of humans, we obviously can have way more inputs than just two. Right. And each of those inputs can really reflect an AND output, right? Yes. So it like can be an AND-like gate. Right. And so in, in, in a lot of sense, even though it may not necessarily translate perfectly into the computer world, one of the things that we can see is like multiple, multiple inputs in the information we receive or the things that we're interacting with that cause us to react a certain way. And these can become habitual, right? These can become things that we don't even think about. Like computers, for instance, when they in, interact with an AND gate, is there much thought process that goes behind what they should do? The computer doesn't really think. It just <laughs> acts. It just acts, right? And so yeah. the, the thing about a gate is, do I 
react or respond or do I have an action because these two inputs have happened, right? Right. Well, it also comes in, oh, these could also correspond to muscle memory. Mm. When you've done activities for so long, you know what the inputs all are, like driving. <laughs> you know, you drive up to a stop sign. You're in a car and there's a stop sign. You stop. You know what you do. Once you've done it for a while, it all just becomes automatic and second nature. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people, you hear stories all the time, of people going on long car trips and they aren't asleep or they aren't unconscious. They'll just say they'll be driving along. Then suddenly, oh, I'm home. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember <laughs> right. the journey. Well, and the, and the thing about this too, though, is these automatic responses or these responses that we have with our gates. And this is kind of where we're eventually going to, going to really challenge ourselves as using the gate language are or is the and gates that we have in our lives that are automatic or maybe not as automatic as they should be maybe are they good for us because i think like you and me, well i know for both of us we have a christian background and there are some and gates that were instilled in us as kids that as we grew up we should not have been and gates right yes yeah, and so in, in in reflecting on this, this is where that OR gate comes in. That OR gate is so helpful because, for instance, you're a person and you're present to me. Therefore, I'm going to talk to you. That's an OR gate. Or you're a person, but maybe you're not necessarily present. Am I still going to talk to you? I don't know if that's a great example. Do you have another one of an OR gate? Well, to put it more simply... An AND gate is way more specific. You have to have multiple things be a certain way before it does something. Mm -hmm. An OR gate only needs one thing to be that way for you to do something. So it's more like an AND gate would be you only eat pepperoni pizza ever. But an OR gate would be like, oh, you'll eat any kind of pizza. It's just pizza. Yeah, so to clarify that pizza analogy, I really like that one. It's a pizza, and it has pepperoni, therefore I can eat it. That and gate lets that through, but if it's an and gate, it's pizza, but it has olives on it, nope, not mm -hmm. going to eat it, right? An or gate is, in terms of human psychology or action, is more accepting than an and gate is. Mm -hmm. It's more open. And it only re receive, it only needs one thing to have a response, right? Right. Okay. You now, wouldn't necessarily want to be a detective and just have a whole bunch of or gates because you'd convict everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you were here. You, you must were, have done it. <laughs> you were in the house, so you are guilty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and that goes that goes to the other idea behind this is that I think that where we where we've actually come to a place is like I mean, living a life with just or gates. I mean. That's accepting of everything. Oh, like, I, I think when we were first having this conversation, it was like, oh, meth? Yeah, I'll try that. Oh, this thing. I'll do that. Oh, there's a cliff? Jump off of it. Those or gates. If our life is just or gates, I mean, man. It can what, be dangerous. It can be incredibly dangerous and incredibly destructive to people because if there are not and gates that can help us interact with the things around us, we will self-destruct. And I think like the opposite is true. If our life is all a bunch of and gates, are we really living? We wouldn't do anything. Right? <laughs> yeah, it would have to be so specific that just walking outside the door, oh, there's a breeze, gotta go back inside. If we had too many and gates in our lives, really we prevent ourselves from living but on the on the flip side if we have too many or gates i would also say we're not living either we're more likely to die <laughs> right well and some would say like well you jumped off that cliff and you really got to experience life it's like well it ended like i mean like that how how could i say i really experienced life if it was terminated right there yeah and so there has to be this balance and in the midst of this we were talking, it's like, okay, so how, how do we as humans really kind of 
find some of the balance in here and and really because i think as i've grown up there are a lot of and gates that i had when i was a kid that were really good that i needed as a kid to keep me safe you know because i didn't necessarily see everything in the world and the world didn't necessarily even see me as a kid but as i grew up i needed to change some of those and gates to or gates right Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's a natural process for us as human beings is we don't need as many safety things because we kind of know what's going on. And I don't want to say that's that's a universal truth. But one of the things that we talked about to test or to do this self-reflection, which is really important, or even one of the one of the things that you brought up was calling it devil's advocate in the midst of this is is those beautiful not gates. What, what does the not gate do again? So the knot gate basically flips the answer on its head. So in the case of humans where you would say no, you would say yes. Where you'd say yes, you'd say no. A knot and gate lets the vast majority of things through, but not when both inputs are correct. And the knot or gate only really lets one thing through. Hmm. How could the knot and gate be a good way to do some self-reflection well i think if you have an and gate like the pizza analogy you say that has to be pizza it has to be pepperoni or no eat Mm -hmm. well the not and gate can play the devil's advocate and say well what would happen if i did eat if neither or one of those inputs wasn't there Mm-hmm. Like if it, instead of a pizza, it was a salad, or if it was a pizza, but it wasn't pepperoni, mm-hmm. it had pineapples on it. <gasps> <laughs> so the not end, I think, really kind of plays the what would happen if I did the opposite of what I think I should do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think naturally that happens as we're growing up in like that that rebellious stage in life. I'm not gonna do this. I'm gonna test all my and gates and not. Yep. <laughs> what happens, mom, dad, not? You know? Yeah. <laughs> and I think there's a natural human response to test our not gates, but mm-hmm. I also think there's a natural human response to stop testing are not gates. I mean, our and gates. And I don't think that's a good thing. I think that as we mature, as we're growing to test our and gates, to make sure that this is good, because just like you gave, I mean, like the pizza analogy, just the simple thing about eating food to test that. Okay. Well, if it's pizza, there's that input, but then there's all the toppings that go on it. Well, you could find an assortment of different toppings to go on a pizza, but if you come to this place where you're like, all right, I'm done testing stuff. These are all my gates I've done. Well, what about what you, like you said, salad, hot dogs, hamburgers? I mean, you didn't test the other side of that and gate very well. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I don't know about you, but just food is a lifetime of experiences. Right? Yes. I mean, like, if I have decided everything I will ever eat in my entire life by the time I was 18, I would be missing out on a lot of food. Yeah. Right? Right. I'm going to say something that may potentially ruffle some feathers here, but I think it needs to be said. Mm -hmm. We here in America as a whole tend to live pretty well compared to a lot of places in the world. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of and gates when it does come to things like food, where if we had to live in other conditions, we couldn't afford to have. So I think in some senses, it is kind of a privilege to be able to have as many and gates as we can have. Mm -hmm. Now, some gates aren't no, not that's. Not, I'm not saying all of them are, because there's a lot of them that are necessities, and there's a lot of people in every situation is going to have them. But you see a whole lot of videos of these young kids. You know, they have Lamborghinis and they're doing stupid stuff and saying stupid things and living high on life, like they don't have a care on the world, and they're just throwing things away and don't know what they're doing. 
And a lot of other people can't live necessarily that way because these people, if they want something a particular way, they get their way. Uh Whereas other people aren't necessarily able to do that. So I think it's very, very important to test the the and gates that we all have. Uh Every, everybody, it doesn't matter what walk of life you're in, always test your and gates. Uh Because the end gates that you might have in the situation that you find yourself in may not necessarily be beneficial for you if your circumstance changes. Mm. Yeah. Well, and I think that goes to like nature versus nurture stuff. There's a lot of things that are in exactly what you just said. It's like where you were born, where you live, how you grew up personality, all of this plays a really big role in in this and gate because, I mean, even just you and myself, right? The Mm -hmm. way both of us grew up is totally different. Yes. Our personalities, not just even the way we grew up. I mean, we're totally different. Yes. (laughs) And, and, And if any of you guys are listening and don't know, don't realize how different Taylor and I are, I mean... We are, I I would say if there was a black and white and night and day, that would be Taylor and me. (laughs) I'm an introvert. (laughs) I'm I'm an incredible extrovert. Everything I do is with people. And I'm like, get me into the crowd. Let's go. And Taylor's like, (laughs) no, stay away (laughs) from me, people. (laughs) Yeah, it's like two people is all that, you know. And then even in the way we grew up, I can remember (laughs) one of my favorite stories. I'm the oldest of six. Okay. Taylor's the youngest of two. Two. There's two of you. And when I grew up, our house was a zoo. And I can remember my very first time ever going over to Taylor's house. And it was so quiet at his house. I felt like I had to whisper. Like I was sitting there, (laughs) Taylor. (laughs) Like, remember? I remember. Uh, So when we do this, though, The AND gates that Taylor has and the AND gates that I have, we really want to test them even in different environments. Just like whispering, it's quiet and there's not a lot of noise, so I got to whisper. Well, that wasn't the case, right? I could talk as normal as I wanted to. That was my natural instinct there. Right. (laughs) So... But there's, there's just like so many instances where we need to be checking this. We need to be doing this. And in addition to that, how can you ever check your and on or gates if you don't have people in your life who are helping you see them right right i have some really important people in my life who have spoken and even revealed some of my and gates that i really needed to change to an or gate and i also have some people who have spoken into my life that i disagree with incredibly on a lot of stuff but i've let them speak into my own life so i can check my and and my or gates right right Yeah, like you say, it's very, very important to talk to people about things. Now, I know it's not the easiest thing. I mean, just look at the news or how hard it is to talk to people who disagree with you. Mm -hmm. It's very, very easy to get into the mindset of otherizing the opposing view. If they disagree (laughs) on you on this, they must be an X, you know? Yeah. Now, I would say 99% of the time, that's incorrect. And well, I'm guilty of this, too. Yeah, well, and you're creating an AND gate for that person, mm-hmm. right? You're right. automatically creating a gate that prevents you from being able to see or react to that person as a person, right? Yeah. You what, right. what was the term that you used? You said it was otherizing, is that right? Otherizing. Right? You are other than the human... That is before me. What? Right. I'm not saying, I mean, this is this is something that everybody does. Mm-hmm. I don't care what you believe, where you are, everybody does this. We all want to be correct. Mm-hmm. And when something challenges that, a lot of people's first response is to go to their end gate and immediately shut down the conversation and say no. Mm-hmm. Just shut that really... power off and just be like, right. Now, that being said, just because you talk to them or you should allow them to talk doesn't necessarily mean they are correct either. Right. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean... mean you are correct either. Right. Well, and it also doesn't mean that you have to change your AND gate to an OR gate. Right. And when I talk about that gate, I don't mean that gate of otherizing. 
I mean that gate that is your belief. Whatever that belief could be. And the, like to be in conversation, to test your gates does not mean that you must change your gates or change who right. you are. Right? Right. That's the thing. The more you test them, the stronger they can be if you are correct. You can reinforce your gate. Mm -hmm. That's why it's important to talk to people about things because they can challenge the gates you have. If you are, in fact, incorrect and what they say is correct, how would you know unless you listen to them? Now, you could be very much correct mm -hmm. and having them speak and talk to you about a lot of this could reinforce your gate. Mm -hmm. Either way, you come out better and so does that person. Well, if they're allowing you to, yes, I think I think the thing that really happens a lot of times too, in the negative sense, is when those conversations have too much otherizing. Yes, like when we, and I think this is like, I think this is the struggle of of all people, especially when, like you said, in conflict, is it's really hard to hear what the other person is saying because we're so ingrained in what who we are, you know. Yes, and a lot of that comes from our nature and nurture again. But really, the goal, I think, in conflict is not necessarily to always agree, right? Right. But it's at least to find some common ground to be able to have that conversation. Right. Between the two of us, we've had our fair share of conflicts where had we not come together to talk about it, I don't think we would be talking today. No. Yeah. Because either I would do something stupid or I would think you did something that if I didn't talk to you about, I would have just sit, sat there and stewed. Yeah, like Nathan set this appointment up and he didn't show up, therefore he doesn't care for me. <laughs> or And that's hurtful. That does happen. Or Taylor's angry at me and not talking to me, therefore he hates me. Which isn't the case. But we interpret these, you know, we allow AND gates and OR gates. I mean, it's crazy. It is. It's crazy how, how a lot of this stuff, when we're not really to, willing to step back and say, was that really an AND gate or should I have let it be an OR gate? And that's where that NOT gate really comes in handy. And even with OR gates, remember, like, NOT OR gates. I know we said the NOT AND gates, like, lets you really test those AND gates. But the NOT gate with the OR, it also lets you kind of maybe see, like, is it really a good thing for me to let all these things in, right? Mm -hmm. And just say like, hey, let's pause for not coffee. <laughs> no, 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 no. There's no, no, that's a bad one. We're not going to go there. I have to have my coffee, <laughs> right? What would it look like if we had not something? Yeah, the not or is very valuable because there are a lot of situations where I mean, we all do this. We all want to fit in with whatever particular group we attach ourselves to. But if they start doing something that's not necessarily the best thing to do, we need to be able to test our ors and say, is this the thing that I need to be letting into my life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a huge step to finding yourself and being able to identify I can, I mean, I'm not going to go in. There's too many instances where I've sat there and said, this or gate is not good. And I've had to say, I have to stop it. And I've, I'm the better for it. Well, I, I think continuing to talk about this, this thing, and, and as we're thinking about this, connecting it to the fact that and and or gates exist to be, you know, zeros and ones or, or power on and off. We, we kind of talked a little bit about what would happen if we were off all the time. If we let nothing interact with us as human beings and we just never respond or we just we're off all the time, what would that look like? We'd be vegetables. <laughs> right? We would do nothing. I mean, like, and maybe we, we know some people who are like this who have so many and gates that they can never interact. Nothing ever happens. And I would say that, that that's almost a vegetative state of a, a, a less than human place to be because not that I want to say it's otherizing, but when we have no ability to interact with the world around us or willingness, I would even say more, more along the lines of willingness to deal with it because there are instances where it's not necessarily a choice going back to nature and nurture, but that's another topic in and of itself. But when we're off all the time, it's 
what's what's the point, right? Yeah. But on the flip side of that, when we're on all the time, I mean, maybe you guys know these people who are just everything is go, 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 on, 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 must, must, must. I, I think of the movie Yes Man. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Like, what happens? It's a miserable existence. Why is it miserable? Because you can never stop rest. You're always go, go, go. You burn out. Yeah, and, and I mean, I'm prone to being on all the time. Like, I just am like, yes, 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 yes. I want to do, I want to be. And I think this is a problem with our world, right? I mean, like technology studies are out there about how kids are never able to turn off and go to sleep and find rest because they're always connected to something. And I don't have the studies with me right now. I wish I did. But in, in looking into this onness all the time, like we as a world are more connected than we've ever been, which is a great thing. But at the same time, we really need to find that time to shut off. Yes, we do. But not stay there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then this goes back to you and I being very different people. I'm prone to being off all the time. <laughs> <laughs> If I was left to my own devices, you could I could live under a rock and if you just slide me a piece of pizza every day and I'd never have to do anything or talk to anybody, I'd be happy. <laughs> that's that's my that's actually my dad too, kinda. He's like, you know, I could live in my little thing and delivery person can come by and be like, Hello <laughs> <You know? laughs> And he'd be content, you know. Yeah. But even that might be a little bit too much. I don't wanna see it. So <laughs> but mm -hmm. But that's, I think that's the thing that makes us human. It, as we've talked about this, our original purpose is to bring a language of coding, this, this idea of computer world, and finding ways to bridge this gap of helping us become more human. And I think one of the beautiful things that we found in this is the fact that we can't be on all the time and we can't be off all the time, but we really do need each other to help us find those moments to get us out of that. All right. Right, you need people to pull you out of your dungeon, your your rock. Right, <laughs> yes. you need people who would say, "I'm not just gonna give you a pizza. I'm sucking you out of here." <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. No. Right, but we also, I also need people who will say, "Stop, Nathan. Go get some rest. Shut off." Like, no, you're not doing that. And I'm gonna brag. Like, I have a beautiful, amazing wife who helps me. She's an introvert, and one of the things that makes our relationship so great is just like you and me, not that we're married, but we, but my wife helps me stop, but I also help my wife not be home. There's this balance that we as humans can do, and when we allow each other to help us become more human, I mean, life is amazing, man, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's where it's at, so I think... Going back to com computers do a thousands of computations each second. Think about how many computations have occurred to even just display a video game. Just the mm -hmm. movements. You were even just talking about pixelations, right? I mean, that just happens so fast, right? Right. But even with that, they still need to take a break. Otherwise, they burn out and they die and they say, I hate you. You're never going to see me again. Here's the blue screen of death. Or that red ring of death, yes. you know. There's there's always, like, mm -hmm. if we go too much, it dies. And I would say the same thing happens when we just don't use things. Or when we just stop, right? Right. It's important as we're moving forward with this conversation, as we're going to talk about some things, we need gates in our lives, both and and or, so that we can keep moving, but take breaks. But also not get stuck in the off and keep moving, Right. Right. It's this give and take kind of thing. And we also can only do that when we interact with others. I, I would argue that when we don't interact with other people, we aren't able to keep going the way we do. I don't know. Would you agree with that? I would agree. Yeah. Now, in your case, it's like a limited amount of people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, for you, you have to force the limit on the number of people you interact with for right. me you have to force people to force me to interact with anybody <laughs> and i think the difference here too thinking about that comment too for me i have to force the limit of 
people that I'm in meaningful relationship with, right? Because the tendency yes. is this is this is I I would say almost we're like the Andor gates. <laughs> if we're gonna compare, I can let too many people in. I can let too many things into my life that are people. And when I was younger, that was incredibly destructive for me. I had to start having friends like you who said, uh, maybe that relationship isn't the best, Nathan. That should really be an and gate, and that and gate should shut you off. <laughs> right? Yeah. But uh, likewise, for me and you, it's like, well, Taylor, there should be more a or gates in your life. You should say, like, let's get out a little more. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it makes us more human. Any last yep. things from you, Taylor? Well, I would just ask everybody to make sure your gates are set properly. That's right. And if you've listened this far, thank you. <laughs> yeah, put thank up you with us. Your, yeah, thank you for your patience. <laughs> thank you for tolerating us. Mm -hmm. 